Hello, I'm Susan King. I'm the Dean of the School of Journalism and Mass Communication here at UNC Chapel Hill. And I'm very excited to have with me Mary Junk, CEO of Lee Enterprise, major media mogul. But we're bragging for one reason today, Mary, because you are one of our master's students, and we're very proud of that fact. Welcome. Great. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Well, I want to talk about the business, because I the, the business of news is changing so much. And um, I we're going to talk about leadership later on today. So um, we don't have to go into all the elements of leadership, but I really want to talk about the business of change. You've been a major player in the newspaper business, particularly leading the Baltimore Sun, one of the Tribune papers, then going out and being part of Lee Enterprise. So you've been there when newspaper was king, king of a town, real civic leader. And now when it's all been disrupted, what's it like being at the seat of this sea change? Well, it's not, uh, I would say, for the faint of heart, because, as you note, uh, the industry has really changed a lot in my career. And even, even over the last five or six years, it's changed a lot. Um, and I think if you can kind of keep your wits about you, uh, it's very exciting even now, because there's more ways to reach readers than ever before. And we have a chance to have, in many of our markets, we do have bigger audiences than we've ever had, because we have mobile apps, mobile web, desktop, et cetera. And at the same time, there's new ways for advertisers to use us. So um, it's actually a very exciting time. And even in these days that are a little bit different than they used to be, newspapers in their associated institutions, their websites and mobile apps and so forth, still tend to be pretty strong civic leaders in the communities that they serve. Typically, you're still a pretty important player on the Chamber of Commerce, the United Way. A lot of our publishers lead the United Way fund drive. So newspapers still have a very big voice, I think, in their communities. And of course, Lee Enterprises is in Davenport, Iowa, one of the great civic states in this country. That's right. But you've got properties all over the country. We have uh, 50 properties all over the United States, from Glens Falls, New York, to the Oregon coast. Um, our biggest operations are in uh, St. Louis, Missouri, uh, Madison, Wisconsin, Lincoln, Nebraska, uh, Davenport, Iowa is a nice location. Billings, Montana is another uh, good sized paper for us. But we have papers in California, but we have a focus kind of in, in the Midwest and Upper West, North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana. And is that important these days? It was a time when everybody was just growing, growing, growing and buying up properties. Is it important to have a niche? Uh, I think it's important. I think the. And the word they use now is uh, your portfolio. But um, the papers that you own are really important. And we tend to have papers in midsize and smallish markets, uh, which tend to be a little less competitive than the big metros. And kind of the way we think about it is, and a lot of other people think about it this way too, in the top 10 metro markets in this, com in this country, it's really very, very competitive on a, on a bunch of levels related to information. Take a New York or a Chicago, places like that, because the cities are so big, and defining what is your community is really a little bit difficult in Los Angeles, for instance. But if you move down the... Uh, cities and get past, say, number 10, number 15, places like St. Louis, which is 21st, it, St. Louis has a very clear sense of community. And it's pretty easy to figure out what kind of news do we need to cover. And that makes a lot of difference. So we have a no huge papers. Our biggest paper is St. Louis. And in places like Billings, Montana, it's very easy to figure out what to cover, what are people interested in. So I think, it's, I think the kinds of markets that you're in uh, is very important. And is that sense of community journalism really important rather than being just a bringer of news? In other words, having a, a stake in the community, uh, one of the financial pluses? Yeah, I think it is one of the financial pluses. I think another plus, and this can be a minus too, as I'm sure you know coming out of a news background, is in many of our communities, if not most, if you're a reporter or an editor or a publisher, you can meet people in the grocery store who are going to tell you, 
they either loved the editorial, hated the editorial, the sports coverage, that kind of thing. So you are connected in a pretty personal way in these kinds of communities, which can be good, and it can, <laughs> it can be bad if you don't like to get that kind of one-on-one -on -one criticism. But I used to think of the newspapers as civic leaders, also some uh, people who would be pressured by all the players in a city or in a community. You have a responsibility to do this. These days, you have a responsibility to be financially stable. Mm -hmm. Does it change the dynamic with what the community expects out of you? I don't think it has changed the dynamic, actually. Hmm. One of the interesting sidelights on that, which you didn't exactly ask, is um, newspaper publishers are typically in their markets, even now, asked to serve on all kinds of boards, the Chamber of Commerce Board, the local hospital board, the Symphony, the United Way. Um, and one of the things that uh, at least some publishers say, and I say, have said when I've asked to serve is, I'll be happy to do it, but you need to know this isn't going to give you any better coverage or more promotional oomph from the newspaper. In fact, in some cases, it works in the opposite direction because yeah. you want to make sure you're being completely fair. Uh, do you feel you, if I understand correctly, Lee has mm -hmm. gotten rid of other media properties. So newspapering is what your sweet spot is. We have uh, 50 daily newspapers. We have about 300 specialty publications. And of course, we have websites, mobile sites, mobile apps in all of our markets. But we, we have no TV. We also own one of the largest uh, agri-media publishing companies in the United States, which is uh, headquartered out of Bismarck, and we also uh, own a uh, company called Town News, which provides uh, web hosting for about a thousand U.S. newspapers. Wow. So, but we're principally uh, newspaper publishing. So the newspaper's not dead? The new, well, no, the newspaper is not dead, and it's a, it's a uh, question that, um, really was on everybody's mind in the media business four or five years ago. Kind of on a weekly basis, there would be <laughs> some story out there that the wheels are really coming off of this model, and before you know it, there aren't going to be any newspapers. Over the last four or five years, as the economy has improved uh, is part of it, and there's just kind of been more time go by, I think the resilience of the newspaper has really been pretty strong. And so in, at some point, I suppose the newspaper may go away. I don't think for sure it's not going to be in, in my lifetime because there's really a lot of strength left in the newspaper. And underlying the newspaper is the institution that gathers the news, sells the advertising. And that at the end of the day is what our uh, companies do. We whether gather news, yeah. Whether it's online or, exactly. or in print, right? Exactly. Although print has shown itself to be really, really resilient. And, and one really good example of that is um, on Sunday, you can get all these advertising circulars. And many people, some people don't look at them, many people do. And retailers will tell you, the big retailers, Target, Best Buy, Pennies, et cetera, will tell you that that is either their number one or number two advertising medium to get people in their stores. So newspaper works for our advertisers and it works for a lot of our customers. But at the same time, we know and consumers are increasingly going to various digital platforms. So we, of course, do that as well. But um, do you think that you'll become just a you know, one platform, an online kind of news generating thing? Or do, you, or do you feel like, and so that you're really about the news business? Or do you think that you'll stay in the paper side of things for as long as? I think, I think the paper, the printed newspaper is going to be around for quite a while. How long? I don't know. But um, even today, in our markets, a good share of our audience reads only the newspaper. There's another big hunk that reads both the newspaper and then accesses on various digital formats. But the strength of the daily newspaper is bigger than most people realize it is. Are you worried about the young people? Well, the, it's, it's really, it's interesting. Our surveys show that young people, and by young people we mean people in their 20s, 
really 18 to 29. Uh, it's very interesting. There's a group of those who read the newspaper, hmm. and there's a lot of those young people who both read the newspaper and who access, access us uh, in some digital format. And then there's a really big percentage of young people who say they don't read the newspaper, but they use the newspaper, which is an interesting distinction. And when you delve into that, which we have in our surveys, uh, what they use the newspaper for is to check sports scores, look at entertainment options, check coupons, that kind of thing, which isn't traditionally sort of reading. So it's the difference between reading and use. I know that you sometimes get to talk to Walter, uh, Walter uh, to uh, Buffett, the, the, Indeed, yeah. the, the um, Oracle of Omaha. Right. And of course, there's so much interest here in North Carolina because he just bought a whole slew of newspapers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, he did. Right. So there is a sense that, again, we're talking that there's a sense of optimism right. if you are, I guess, specific about the business model. Right. Um, well, uh, Warren Buffett is a um, substantial investor in Lee, which is why I've met with him several times. And um, his, the newspapers that he tends to like are the kinds of newspapers that Lee has, these sort of mid-sized newspapers in communities that have a clear sense of identity and uh, tend to be regional hubs. Greensboro now is one of his, Winston-Salem. Right. Those kinds of markets he's very keen on, and he sees... Um, a pretty good future, I think. Yeah. Well, this is all optimism for me right. and for our right. students yeah. today. Yeah. Um, love your perspective. As chair of AP, you also see an institution that grew up out of a difficult time in the right. news business. Mm -hmm. um, it's been reinventing itself. It's uh, healthy, doing well. Well, the, the AP is a um, great institution. Um, and as you probably know, it was founded in 1849, so it's been around a while. And it started out and still is a cooperative. Uh, and originally, uh, it was just newspapers. But today, uh, and AP, incidentally, is the largest news gathering organization in the world. They have reporters all over the world. And many, particularly international events, if AP wasn't there, we wouldn't know what went on. But AP, over uh, the years, has changed in how it does business, how it thinks about things. And digital is obviously very important to the AP now. And their customer base is much different than it was even 10 years ago. They serve newspapers, of course, but a, a big piece of who they serve is broadcasters pr produce a lot of video. Most of the international video that you see on TV is generated by AP videographers, and they also have uh, a lot of clients who aren't pure media. Yahoo is a big client, Microsoft, a lot of international business too. The BBC is a big client, Al Jazeera is a very big client. So the business has really changed and uh, AP is really in a very good place right now. Mm. So it's part of the knowledge economy and the information. It is, sort of yeah, it absolutely is. Yeah, it absolutely is. People talk about it as a nonprofit because it is a cooperative. It is, yep. Um, and there was a lot of you know, excitement around the idea of nonprofit journalism filling mm -hmm. in where profit mm -hmm. was going, mm -hmm. pro-public and such. Right. Do you think nonprofit is uh, up to, to grow? Do you think that is an answer for the expensive gathering of news that may not have a market? Or? Um, my own view is not really. And I say that because um, to do, and this word isn't in fashion quite so much anymore, but to do significant journalism, the word not always in fashion being journalism, but to do good solid reporting uh, takes time and it hence takes money. And you, uh, to do a great job of that you need to be trained. I mean you need to know how to gather the facts, you need to, how to know how to check the facts, use public databases, that kind of thing. And it's not a cheap endeavor as you, as you know. And so some of these not-for-profit uh, organizations might get some stories, but to really cover a market, I think you need uh, a staff of paid professional reporters, photographers, and editors. You also need safety, and a lot of the world has gotten pretty right. rough. Right. And uh, AP, I understand, has got people, you know, folks who live in the communities now also 
They do. Put, yeah, no, that's exactly who right. Who understand their communities mm -hmm. rather than mm -hmm. just Americans flying mm -hmm. in or such. Mm -hmm. um, when you were studying here, getting your master's, you wanted that extra something that uh, to, to push you over the top. Mm -hmm. um, what was it that you sought in um, a master's degree, and, and what was it that you got? Because some people say, who? Journalism, business, you don't need a master's degree. Um, well, at the risk of telling something that's not too interesting, when I graduated from college, I had a degree in English. Um, and <laughs> in those years, if you had a degree in English and were a woman, what you could mainly do is teach, which I didn't want to do. And I had been the editor of my college yearbook, which I thought qualified me <laughs> to be a journalist. Um, so I applied to graduate school and got an assistantship to come here. So that's why I came. And um, I wanted to be work at a daily newspaper. I wanted to be a reporter, and I eventually wanted to be a publisher, even at a relatively young age. I don't really know how that came into my mind, but that's what I wanted to do. And so I think one of the uh, important things I learned here is around, and this is going to sound sort of pedantic here, but around research and around knowing uh, your audience, knowing who's out there reading you, thinking about markets, where could you get more readers, how could you change what you do to appeal to more people. And that, I think, is a really terrific, it was a great mindset then when it was easier, and it's a terrific mindset now. Because I think there are a lot of opportunities, but I think you need to be a little bit analytical about how you think about how you go after various reader segments or audience segments, or same thing on the advertising side. So your advice to students today, undergrads or graduates? Well, the other thing I would say besides this sort of analytical research orientation is uh, the other thing that has really served me well is news writing. And like a lot of your, if not all your students, all? I, took, I took news writing. The dreaded 153 yeah, news writing course. Yeah, I was going to say news writing 153, and at the time I wasn't crazy about it either, but it is one of the best courses I took in my entire college career because I turned into a pretty decent writer. Mm -hmm. And even though I don't write stories for a living now, I write memos, I write emails, and it's really a great skill in the workplace to be a good writer, if not a very good writer. So my advice would be learn to write. Um, it's been a good career for you, hasn't it? it has, it's been a great career. It's been a great career, and one of the reasons, probably the biggest reason it's been, well, there's more than one reason, but one of the reasons it's a great career is that, um, and this is probably going to sound corny, but at the end of the day, many people in the industry, if not most, including me, believe that what we do really matters, that we're not manufacturing shoes or anything like that, that what we do matters in the communities that we're serving, that stories we write, if we didn't write them, they wouldn't be written. The watchdog journalism uh, is still alive and well. So we think, I think what we do is important for our communities. And at the end of the day, I think it's important for democracy, frankly. So, and that, that's great because it's sort of, I don't want to say it's a higher calling, but it's not just a job. For me, that, that's music to my ears. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just terrific. Thanks for being with us, Mary. Not only that you're a, a woman CEO, not only that you're a CEO where the business is doing well, you brought us an optimistic tale, and, and you're a Tar Heel. Great. Go Tar Heels, <laughs> yeah.